In this lecture, we're going to talk about the Greeks, their culture. Uh, we're going to talk about the Homeric tales, Greek life, Greek warfare, the Greek games, and then the Persian wars. All of this in the context of our relief sculpture project. So we're going to talk a little bit about the relief sculptures that they created um, a little in this lecture, but mostly in the next lecture. So here is a sculpture of Homer, and he is their philosopher, historian, poet. Greek culture centers around the Homeric tales, which are believed to have been written around 800 BC. That's about when they were written. They were the Bible and Shakespeare combined. The only Homeric tales that we know of for certain are the Odyssey and the Iliad, though there were most likely quite a few more. Homer was writing about a time when the Greeks were just beginning to recover from a huge collapse in their culture. The cause of this collapse is unclear. He was writing mostly about the Trojan Wars, which are believed to have taken place around 500 years before Homer's time. So here we have Achilles killing Hector, and this is a scene from the Iliad. And this is a slip painting on a Greek pot. The Trojan War was waged against the city of Troy by the Achaeans, also called the Mycenaeans, Mycenaean Greeks. After Paris of Troy took Helen from her husband Menelaus, king of Sparta. That's kind of how the, the wars began. And this story is an account of just a few weeks of the battle. And if you read it, it reads kind of like an action movie. They, they say like catchy, you know, lines before they charge and jump and do crazy moves. And that's where we get some of the uh, terms that we still use today, like things like bit the dust that comes from the Iliad. The Odyssey, you're probably familiar with that story. Here's... Um, Ulysses, also known as Odysseus, giving wine to Polythemus, Polyphemus, uh, who's a cyclops, son of Neptune, Neptune the god of the sea. And this is an illustration. Um, it's not a Greek pot. This is a more modern illustration. And so the Odyssey is the account of the hero Odysseus's journey home from Troy to Greece. So uh, after the war, it's his journey home and all the trials and tribulations that he faces on his journey. So he gets trapped in a cave um, trying to steal the sheep of the Cyclops, and then they get him drunk and stab him in the eye and sneak out of the cave on the bellies of the sheep. So uh, the story ends with uh, Ulysses a.k.a. Odysseus, returning from his odyssey. And there's all these guys in his house, and they are trying to court his wife and marry her because he's like a wealthy, important guy, and they want his wife and all his stuff. And he comes home, he challenges them, he, he disguises himself as an old man and challenges them to a um, bow shooting contest. And, of course, he wins, and then he's like, he's like, psych! I'm not an old man, I'm Odysseus, and I'm going to kill you all. Greece was broken up into many city-states called polis. Each one is called a polis, the most powerful of which was Athens. They were centered around one high point or city center known as an Acropolis. The, the Parthenon is the most famous of these structures. It is built on top of the Acropolis at Athens. So this is what it might look like. Here's the Acropolis here. And you can look out, see what's going on, have your religious ceremonies and stuff. Here's your city. And then um, you're going to have like a stadium where you can do, or like the gymnasium. And you're going to do your um, competitions and exercises. And then out here you're going to have your gardens, your crops, all that growing. And then, you know, they were, they were, uh, pretty good with the seafarers, so they're often on the coast and would have a port. Nine out of ten ancient Greeks were farmers. They kept goats and ate barley, wheat, grapes, figs, olives, beans, lentils, and a variety of vegetables. 
and they were wine drinkers. Wine was an important part of the Greek culture and was widely traded as far back as Mycenaean Greece in 1500 BC. There were cults of the god of wine Dionysus and a festival. Parties and orgies were held in his honor. So here's Dionysus and he's kind of drunk and he's got his little wine vessel here and here's some, some nice people helping him get to wherever he needs to go. Here's Dionysus extending a drink. He is associated with the bounty of nature, the harvest, grapes, and winemaking. He's also associated with pleasure, ecstasy, and madness. There are multiple accounts of his origin, leading many to believe that he may be a combination of gods. So the Greeks, they adopted um, some of their belief systems from uh, some of the earlier surrounding cultures. The most popular account says that he was the son of Zeus and Semele. Out of jealousy, Hera, disguised as one of her friends, tells the pregnant Semele, Hera is uh, Zeus's wife, by the way, tells the pregnant Semele that if the father of her child is divine, then get him to appear in his divine form. When Zeus appears, she is so startled by his appearance, she gives birth prematurely. Zeus then sews the child up in his thigh until he is mature enough to be born. And here's a Greek crater. Uh, crater is like a, this, this is the lid of the crater. And that, so that's a container that um, for shipping. And here is Dionysus in a sailboat surrounded by dolphins from 530 BC. Dionysus traveled through the Mediterranean and the East spreading uh, grapes and wine. Traveling through Egypt, Damascus, and India, some accepted him and some did not. So some people tried to hijack his ship and take all his, his seeds and his wine. And he said, I'm going to turn you into dolphins. And that's what he did. Uh, here is a marble sarcophagus depicting the triumph of Dionysus. He's also known as Bacchus. The, the Romans called him Bacchus. And uh, the seasons... That represents the seasons as well. And this is an example of uh, a Greek style relief sculpture. So you can see it's all on a flat surface and the dimensionality comes out. Everything's attached to the flat surface, but it's dimensional. Zeus ruled over his unruly family of Olympians while they bickered and fought and got jealous of each other. Zeus always had an eye for beautiful women, which often got him into trouble with his wife Hera. A less than stellar father figure, Zeus once tossed Hera's son, Hephaestus, off the top of, a Mount, of Mount Olympus because the baby was too ugly. Real, real nice father, huh? But Hephaestus is kind of an interesting character, too. He was a blacksmith. And he made armor for um, for the Mycenaean Greeks in their battle uh, with Troy from the Iliad. And um, by the sixth century BC, they had a pantheon of gods, which was a combination of tribal deities as well as gods from ancient Aryan invaders. So here's a little family tree. The Greek geography was crucial for the development of their society. The rocky peaks and valleys divided up their territory into different city-states who were hard to conquer because armies with chariots and cavalry could not handle the terrain. It also allowed these states to experiment with different forms of government without fear of dominance by outsiders. Yeah, if you compare that to like Mesopotamia it was a much flatter area, um, much, uh, much more conflict there because, you know, it was easy to roll in with your army and conquer. Uh, so 
therefore there's a lot more war and turnover in Mes nearby Mesopotamia. They started out under the common power structure of the time with warrior aristocrats ruling over the tribal groups. As urbanization increased, the aristocrats began to lose power to group decision making. Here are the hoplite warriors. In the 7th century BC, they developed a unique and effective, highly organized style of fighting on foot, where they carried a large shield which protected the man to his left, and a large spear for charging, and a sword for close combat. These warriors were called hoplites. This style of fighting helped to bring about an egalitarian mentality as it required a lot of trust and cooperation. Also, anyone who could afford weapons and armor became a valuable asset to society, which included a large set of the population. War brought people together and created a sense of identity and camaraderie and strengthened the culture. The Greek games also brought people from different polis together and further united their culture. Men would train naked and oiled at gymnasiums, which promoted a culture of homosexuality between men and also men and boys. As the Greeks grew in power, conquering their neighboring tribes and taking slaves, they gained more leisure time, which was used to develop philosophy, art, and government. In order for the democracy to function, the Greeks developed an educated citizenry which could debate important issues and make informed decisions through voting. These actually, this leads to the next um, next uh, bit of information. These are slaves carrying um, probably like food or grain or something like that. Voting was still only permitted by land-owning men and not women or slaves. Slaves continued to support the society, allowing for further development of art, philosophy, music, theater, and government. For every free male Athenian citizen, there were two slaves. War and slavery underpinned the Greek accomplishments. Kind of a twisted irony there where democracy is supported by slavery. War with the Persians began with the Ionian Revolt of 499 BC. The Greeks sent weapons, ships, and money to help the Ionians, but they were defeated by Cyrus, the successor of Darius. <clears throat> they were, excuse me. War with the Persians began with the Ionian Revolt of 499 BC. The Greeks sent weapons, ships, and money to help the Ionians, but they were defeated. Yeah, the Ionians were defeated. So they're right here on this coast. Here you got your Greeks over here, and the Ionians were kind of right in here. But the, yeah, the Ionian revolt was defeated. They were culturally Greek in Ionia, and so they were sort of the cousins of the Greeks, and they were being conquered by the Persians. So Cyrus's successor, Darius, was determined to punish the Greeks for the support of the Ionian revolt. So here, if you zoom in on that coast area I was just pointing to, here's Ionia, and then you have the Greeks here. This is all Greek, Greek territory. Uh, Darius sends an army to invade the Greeks by sea, but the ship crashes and the army mostly dies. After that, legend says that Darius has his servant tell him every day, remember the Greeks. Then, in 492, Darius sends an army of around 50,000 men to attack Athens. Here's a recreation depiction of the Battle of Marathon from 490 BC. While on their way to capture Athens, the Persians were defeated in battle, the Battle of Marathon, by the much smaller Athenian army. It's estimated that the Persians outnumbered the Greeks with anywhere from two to ten times as many soldiers, including cavalry, archers, and while 
the Greeks were on foot with shields and swords. When the Persians returned to their ship and sailed around for an attack on Athens, the Greeks returned to Athens to defend it. Legend says that the Greeks' courier, Pheidippides, ran the 26 miles from Marathon to Athens to warn the Athenians of the impending attack, which is where we get the modern marathon. Ultimately, the Greeks won this battle, and the Persians returned home in defeat. This is a good little tidbit. So this is from uh, the movie, I think the movie 500. That's what they said Xerxes looked like. That was the depiction of him. That's not what he looked like. He looked more like this guy. Darius, frustrated by his defeat, planned to completely conquer the Greeks, but he died before being able to return. He passed his plans on to his son Xerxes in 480 BC. Xerxes personally led the second Persian invasion of Greece with one of the largest ancient armies ever assembled. During the Battle of Thermopylae, around 300 Spartans and other allied Greeks attempted to block a narrow pass on the way to Athens. They held off the Persians for three days, but were ultimately betrayed by a Greek farmer who showed the Persian army a way around the pass where they outflanked the Spartans. The Spartans were kind of like the, the real warrior uh, warriors of the Greeks. And whereas the Athenians were kind of the more aristocrats and they, they would, they united for war, but sometimes they didn't always get along themselves. Victory over the allied Greek states at the famous Battle of Thermopylae allowed the Persians to torch the evacuated Athens and overrun most of Greece. However, while seeking to destroy the combined Greek fleet, the Persians suffered a severe defeat at the Battle of Salamis. The following year, the confederated Greeks went on an offensive, defeating the Persian army at the Battle of Plataea and ending the invasion of Greece. After a few more battles, the Persians were expelled from Greece. Over the following ten years, the Greeks then went on the offensive, expelling the Persians from Macedonia, Macedonia, which is up here, and their other European territory, and eventually liberating Ionia. So they expelled them from all around this area, and then eventually they took back Ionia. Some historical sources suggest that the end of hostilities was marked by a peace treaty between Athens and Persia, the peace of Callias around 450 BC.